Section 22 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 21. Conclusions and Problems. It will be recalled that the primary purpose of the investigations which have been recounted in this volume was to determine, if possible, what traits may be said to characterize children of markedly superior intellectuality. Superior intellectuality is here arbitrarily defined as ability to make a high score on such intelligence tests as the National, the Terman Group, and the Stanford Minute. It is not necessarily to assume that the criterion of intellectual superiority is wholly adequate, or that the superiority itself is either hereditary or abiding. The adequacy of the criterion and the degree of permanence of the superiority which has been found can later be judged in the light of follow-up studies in which the promise of youth is compared with the performance of manhood and womanhood. Regardless of the results which such follow-up studies may yield, it is unquestionably a matter of considerable importance to ascertain the present traits of children earning high intelligence scores. The nature of many of these traits has been indicated in considerable detail in preceding chapters, and the numerous chapter summaries render an inclusive summarization at this point unnecessary. It remains only to bring together a few of the outstanding results of the study and to suggest problems for further investigation. First, however, the reader is cautioned to bear in mind the variability which obtains in the so-called gifted group with respect to the various traits that have been rated or measured. The group has been described throughout in terms of the deviation of its average from the average of unselected children. It does not follow that what is true of the group is true of all its individual members. Where it could be done without unduly extending the report, complete distributions of both the gifted group and the control group have been given. Where this was not feasible, the amount of dispersion from the central tendency has ordinarily been indicated. In most cases, the amount of overlapping of the two groups can readily be computed from the data given, where such computations have not already been made. Doubtless a more compelling realisation of the lack of homogeneity of the group in physical, mental and personality traits could be had from clinical descriptions of appropriately selected cases. At another time, it may be possible to prepare a series of case studies. Their exclusion from the present volume has been a matter of necessity. The validity of the generalizations made regarding the traits which characterize gifted children hinges upon the representative nature of the group studied. We have been at considerable pains to ensure that the group would not be, to any considerable extent, unrepresentative of that entire portion of the child population which is capable of earning an intelligence quotient of 140 or above. We believe that our efforts in this direction have been reasonably successful. It is unlikely that more than 20% of the cases have been missed, out of the total number of children who could have qualified in the school population canvassed. The loss may not have exceeded 10%. Granted that the cases missed might, for some traits of yield distributions differing appreciably from those actually found, there is no likelihood that their inclusion would have modified in any important respect the nature of the conclusions that have been drawn. So far as the traits which have been measured are concerned, one is justified in believing that the characterizations which hold for the experimental group hold for gifted children in general. It is perhaps more important to bear in mind the limits of the field covered by the various tests and measurements that have been applied. For example, it cannot be supposed that the intelligence of our subjects has been measured in all its aspects by the two intelligence tests used, that the full scope and depth of interests have been measured by the interest data, or that the available samplings of character and personality traits tell all it would be worthwhile to know about this group of trait complexes. The 25 traits which have been rated by the parents and teachers are so many out of possible hundreds although it is hoped they are among the most important. The physical measurements and medical examinations were exceptionally complete, but they leave altogether untouched a great many things that one would like to know about the physical correlates of superior mentality. Nevertheless, incomplete and fragmentary as our data are, when compared with the many-sided richness of a child's total mental and physical development, 
it may justly be claimed that they carry us well beyond the bounds of previously established fact. Character analysis and case descriptions based upon the subjective evaluation of the best data to be had from ordinary observation can never take the place of quantitative measurements, even of the crudest sort. If our data are incomplete, they are, at any rate, for the most part, objective and verifiable. No degree of completeness could possibly make good the fault of subjectivity and unverifiableness. If the methods that have been employed have, at times, led to erroneous conclusions, these, in time, will be discovered and corrected. One who suspects error at any point has only to apply the same or demonstrably better objective methods to test the justness of his suspicions. It is to be hoped that sooner or later all our conclusions will thus be put to trial. The ultimate value of our study will be measured more by the investigations when it stimulates or provokes others to make than by the amount of its factual data that later experiments may verify. What are the outstanding characteristics of this group of gifted children? Space is available for mention of but a few, and the temptation to extended discussion must be resisted. The group contains an unexpectedly large proportion of cases in the upper IQ ranges. Assuming the standard deviation of the IQ distribution for unselected children to be between 15 and 18, there is an appreciable excess of 150 IQ cases or better, over and above the theoretical expectation. Above 160 IQ, the number of cases found increases out of all proportion to the theoretically unexpected number, and by IQ 170 exceeds it several times. Unless this discrepancy can be explained as due to the imperfection of the IQ technique, it would appear that the distribution of intelligence in the child population departs considerably from that described by the normal probability curve. The group contains a significant, though not overwhelming, preponderance of boys. This finding is not in harmony with any expectations that could be based upon a comparison of the mean scores earned at intelligence tests by unselected boys and girls of corresponding age. No thoroughly convincing explanation can be formulated from the data at hand, although an examination of various hypotheses suggests that the cause may possibly lie in the greater variability of boys. The fact that the excess of boys over girls is far greater in the high school group than in the younger gifted group raises the question whether the mental growth of boys tends to continue somewhat beyond the level which marks the mental maturity of girls. In physical growth and general health, the gifted group unquestionably rates on the whole somewhat above par. There is no shred of evidence to support the widespread opinion that typically the intellectually precocious child is weak, undersized, or nervously unstable. In so far as a gifted child departs at all from the average on these traits, it is pretty certainly in the other direction. But the fact seems to be that his deviation from the norm on physical traits is in most cases very small indeed in comparison with his deviation in intellectual and volitional traits. Even the slight superiority that he enjoys with respect to physical equipment may or may not be due primarily to endowment. It might be accounted or mainly, if not entirely, by such factors as diet, medical care, and other environmental influences. To explain by the environmental hypothesis the relatively much greater deviation of our group from unselected children with respect to intellectual and volitional traits appears difficult, if not impossible. Our data, however, offer no convincing proof, merely numerous converging lines of evidence. There is marked excess of Jewish and of Northern and Western European stock represented. The number of highly successful, even eminent relatives, is impressively great. The fact that in a state which justly prides itself on the equality of educational opportunity provided for its children of every class and station, an impartially selected gift group should draw so heavily from at the higher occupational levels and so highly from the lower, throws a heavy burden upon the environmental hypothesis. In spite of all our effort to equalize educational opportunity, the ten-year-old child of the California laborer competes for high IQ rank no more successfully than the laborer's son competed for the genius rank in Europe a hundred years ago. This statement is based upon a comparison of the relative number in our group and the Galton D. Candold Ellis genius groups of individuals whose parents belonged to the unskilled or semi-skilled labor classes. Previous studies had only demonstrated the superiority of the high occupational and social class with respect to the number of finished geniuses produced and it was only natural 
that many should prefer to explain this superiority on the ground of educational opportunity. We have demonstrated that the superiority of the same occupational and social classes is no less decisive when the compared offspring are at an age at which educational opportunity is about as nearly equalised as an enlightened democracy can make it. Two possible environmental causes of the intellectual superiority of a gifted group are definitely excluded by the data that have been presented. One, formal schooling, and two, parental income. It has been shown that within a given age group, the intelligence and achievement scores earned are totally uncorrelated with length of school attendance. The median family income does not greatly exceed that for the general population of the cities in question. The families of some of our most gifted subjects are in financial circumstances below the level of moderate comfort. In a majority of cases, the superiority of the gifted group is evidenced at a very early age. Among the most commonly mentioned indications are intellectual curiosity, wealth of miscellaneous information, and desire to learn to read. The frequent presence of such traits among our subjects in the preschool period suggests strongly the influence of endowment. Although in a small minority of cases, attempts at forced culture may have contributed to the result. It is manifestly imposed to account for the general superiority of the group by any such influence. There are, nevertheless, many persons who believe that intelligence quotients can be manufactured to order by the application of suitable methods of training. There are even prominent educators and psychologists who are inclined to regard such a pedagogical feat as in the realm of possibility, and no one knows that it is not. If it is possible, it is time we were finding it out. Conclusive evidence as to the extent to which IQs can be artificially raised could be supplied in a few years by an experiment which would cost a few hundred thousand or almost a few million dollars. The knowledge would probably be worth to humanity a thousand times that amount. Although the majority of our children have had the advantage of superior cultural influences in the home, their more formal educational opportunities have been entirely commonplace in no way superior to those enjoyed by the children from the humblest families of Los Angeles, San Francisco, and Oakland. At school, they have studied and played with the children of the generality. The school has provided for them no special program of instruction. It has given no form of individual treatment except an occasional extra promotion. Such promotions have usually been doubly or trebly earned, for it has been demonstrated by reliable and extensive achievement tests that the average child of our group has already mastered the subject matter of the curriculum two or three grades beyond that in which he was located. More accurately, this promotional slack amounts on the average to about 25% of the child's age. Perhaps because of this fact, the superiority of the group in achievement is only two-thirds or three-fourths as great as its superiority in intelligence. It is evidently a rare experience for a gifted child to begin work of a grade of difficulty commensurate with his intellectual abilities. The excess in achievement above the norm for the gifted child's actual grade status is general rather than special. There is somewhat less marked in spelling and arithmetic than in general information, reading and language. The amount of specialization or unevenness in the abilities of our group was made the subject of extended study by Dr. Devos. His report showed that in respect to measurable disparity of abilities, the gifted child differs little, if at all, from children in general. The one-sidedness of precocious children is mythical. The fact that a considerable proportion of all children show appreciable specialization in their achievements. The gifted child has only his share of this common human trait. Nevertheless, the measurable disparities found are such as to show clearly the necessity of taking them into account in any scheme of vocational or educational guidance for children of every grade of intelligence. It will be one of the important problems in the follow-up of these gifted children to work out the degree of correlation between the specialised achievement in adult life and the special aptitudes discovered in this investigation. The matter of interest was deemed of sufficient importance to warrant investigation from several angles. As would be expected, the interests of gifted children reflect in many ways their intellectual superiority. The school subjects which they like best are for the most part the subjects which unselected children find the most difficult. The vocations which they prefer rank fairly high in the occupational hierarchy with respect to the intellectual demands they make. The reading of gifted children surpasses that of unselected children, both in quantity and quality. The typical gifted child of seven years reads more books than the unselected child reads, 
at any age up to 15 years. Gifted children have more than the usual interest in books of science, history, biography, travel, and informational fiction, and less than books of adventure, mystery, and emotional fiction. The common opinion that intellectually superior children are characterized by a deficiency of play interests has been shown to be wholly unfounded. The mean play information quotient of the gifted group is 136. The typical gifted child of nine years has a larger body of definite knowledge about plays and games than the average child of 12 years. If he devotes somewhat fewer hours per week to play activities, it is because his play interests must compete with a wealth of other interests which are no less compelling. Another finding of considerable importance in this connection is that the play interests of the gifted boy are above rather than below the normal in degree of masculinity. The experiment carried out for the purpose of, of measuring the strength of interests along intellectual, social, and activity lines is perhaps one of the most significant reported in the entire study, whether considered from the point of view of methodology or results. It is probable that the type of instrument which Mrs. Wyman designed for this purpose will be found capable of unlocking many hitherto inaccessible regions of human personality and interest. Adaptation of her method might be devised which would aid in the discovery of special aptitudes and the diagnosis of pre-delinquent and pre-psychotic tendencies. In the present instance, the Wyman test has given a fairly precise measure of three important aspects of interest. It has shown that in strength of intellectual interest, 90% of our gifted children surpass the average of a control group, that the superiority of the gifted in strength of social interests is well nigh as great and that in activity interests, the two groups are practically indistinguishable. That our gifted surpass unselected children in tests of honesty, trustworthiness, and similar moral traits will probably surprise no observant judge of human character. Few have ever denied that there is at least a certain amount of positive correlation between intelligence and character. The K.D. Robenheimer test show that it is considerable. Considering the total score of the seven character tests used, one can say that the gifted child of 9 or 10 years has reached a stage of moral development which is not attained by the average child until the age of 13 or 14. Approximately 85% of the gifted surpass the average of unselected children. The test results in this point are confirmed by the testimony of special class teachers of gifted children. The tests in question are measures of untrustworthiness, of dishonesty of report, of tendency to overstatement, of objectionable social moral attitudes, and of interest in questionable books and questionable companions. A modification of Woodworth's test of psychotic tendencies showed approximately 75% of the gifted above the average of unselected children. Comparison of letter mental troubles and conduct disorders with the results of these tests would be of surprising interest. It should be emphasized, however, that one could find in the gifted group numerous exceptions to the general rule with respect to character, personality, and emotional stability. The gifts are not free from faults, and at least one out of five has more of them than the average child of the general population. Perhaps one out of twenty presents a more or less serious problem in one or another respect. The ratings secured from parents and teachers on the 25 mental, moral, social and physical traits are of value chiefly in their confirmation of the results secured by the method of test. These ratings undoubtedly have a very low reliability for an individual subject, but when used as a basis for comparing the relatively large gifted and control groups, they yield reasonably dependable results. For example, one can say with considerable assurance that gifted children excel the average most of all in intellectual and volitional traits, next in emotional and moral traits, and least in physical and social traits. The purpose and form of this report have tended almost inevitably to centre attention upon the traits of the gifted group rather than upon the control group which they have been compared. To an extent this is unfortunate. A volume could have been devoted to fuller treatment and discussion of the data collected for unselected children, including sex and age differences in each of the following. Scholastic and occupational interests, play interests and play information, reading interests, teachers' readings of scholastic abilities, interest tests, character and personality tests, and ratings by teachers and parents on the 25 selected traits. The reader who is interested may assemble for himself the most essential data on these points from the various chapters of this report. Lack of space prevented our performing this service for him.
Special attention is called to the significance of such data as the age and sex differences disclosed by the interest and personality tests and by the 25 trait ratings. On these and other traits, important data are to be found on the relative variability of the sexes, especially on pages 475, 508 to 512, and 537 to 538. Examination of these data will show that the evidence on variability is inconsistent and therefore inconclusive. A study of superior talent inevitably raises a host of pedagogical problems. It has been no part of our purpose, however, to exploit any theory as to the educational methods best adapted to the gifted child. About the culture of genius next to nothing is known, although new light may in time be expected from the rapidly increasing experimentation with differentiated curricula. Classification by ability and methods of individual instruction. Traditional methods have ignored the problem. Their influence is negative rather than positive. The best that can be hoped for them is that they may not be as bad as they seem. The present neglect of superior talent is sufficiently indicated by the inability of teachers to recognize it. One of the most astonishing facts brought out in this investigation is that one's best chance of identifying the brightest child in a schoolroom is to examine the birth records and select the youngest, rather than take the one rated as brightest by the teacher. Follow-up data covering the first two years after the subjects were located are encouraging. Grade progress and quality of schoolwork indicate that general ability is being fully maintained. The previous good record of school deportment has been improved, and difficulties in the field of social adjustment are clearing up. It is probably very significant that the children who receive the greatest number of extra promotions are in general the ones whose schoolwork has the most improved in quality. Prediction as to the probable future of these children would be profitless. We can only wait and watch. It should be pointed out, however, that to expect all or even a majority of the subjects to obtain any considerable degree of eminence would be unwarranted optimism. In the first place, eminence is a poor measure of success. In the second place, success even in the best sense is largely a product of fortunate chance combinations of personal merits and environmental circumstances. In the third place, the group itself, although far superior to the average, is nothing like as highly selected as the groups of genius adults studied by Galton, Dickendall, Ellis, Castle, Cattell, and others. Each of Galton's subjects, for example, ranked in eminence at least as high as the first in 4,000 adults of the general population. To qualify for our gifted group, it was only necessary for a child to rate as high as the first in 200. Only about one of our subjects in 20, or about 50 in the group of 1,000, would rank as the first in 4,000 of a random selection. About one man in 1,000, in the generality, finds his way into who's who. 20% of our boys rank as high in IQ as the first in 1,000 taken at random. But we should hardly expect so large a proportion to attain who's who's distinction. Perhaps no one would contend that this or any similar type of eminence is more than moderately correlated with general intelligence. In a city of 25,000 population, there are, say, 5,000 males above the age of 30 years. It is with the most distinguished 25 to 50 of such a group that our gifted boys could be most fairly compared a few decades hence. It is hoped that some of the latter volumes which are planned for this series of genetic studies of genius will add at least something to our present knowledge about the origin of exceptional talent, the methods of culture adapted to ensure its fullest development, and the social and government policies that will conserve and utilize it to the best advantage of all. These are the great problems of genius. They are outranked in importance by few, if any, of the issues that confront mankind. They cannot be solved except in the light of psychological, biological, and educational researchers along lines that are still almost wholly unexplored. End of section 22 And the end of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman Recorded by Leon Harvey